Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering oncology. And I believe this is my only second video that I've ever covered oncology. I know for sure I covered a video oncology, uh, oncology, care of the cancer patient. And that you can find in my Fundamentals of Nursing playlist. But for straight oncology, if I'm not mistaken, I believe this is my first video, which means I'm going to create a new playlist for oncology and this should be my first video. So guys, if you haven't done so already, you know what I'm about to ask you. Please do not forget to like and subscribe below. Don't forget that I'm also on TikTok, a YouTube, a Facebook, my handle is still the same, Nexus Nursing. For those who are current students or you're studying for boards, but you need a little, you know, a push, you're needing help in a certain area, don't forget that on my website, I have audio lessons available, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Also, you can get grab yourself a coffee mug where I go over priority patients. I go over uh, blood type compatibilities. I go over important words to uh, recognize when you're reading your textbook to let you know that this most likely is going to be on your exam. So make sure you guys check out my website for those additional resources. Okay, guys, without any further ado, let's get started. First question. A client asked the nurse, does everyone who gets cancer die of it? The nurse's best response is based on which of the following? One, about 5 million people in the United States survive cancer for five or more years. Two, all 1 million people diagnosed in the United States annually will eventually die of their disease. Three, cancer is a leading cause of adult death in the United States. Or four, it destroys hope to discuss dying with a client with cancer. It destroys hope to discuss dying with a client with cancer. I still didn't read that correct. Dying with a client with cancer. Okay, I read that correctly. Sorry, guys. Okay, so the correct answer, guys, is one. About 5 million people in the U.S. survive cancer for five or more years. So that answers the question. Not everybody diagnosed with cancer will die from it. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. Look at number two. What does number two start with? An all-inclusive. What have I told you about all-inclusives? Stay away from them. Do not choose that answer unless you know that you know that you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that that's the correct answer. So if an answer choice includes an all-inclusive such as all, always, never, only, don't choose it unless you know for sure that's the answer. Stay away. So number two is wrong. Three, cancer is the leading cause of adult death in the United States. No, it's not. Heart diseases. Heart disease. And number four, it uh, destroys hope to discuss dying with a client with cancer. In nursing, the correct answer is never going to be the answer choice where you avoid the patient's question or you avoid answering their question, okay? In nursing, we never change the subject or avoid talking about a subject because it makes you uncomfortable or because you feel that um, it may make the patient uncomfortable or you feel that it may discourage the patient. You have to always be honest, gentle, but honest with your patient. So you're not gonna avoid topics. So the correct answer for this, guys, is number one. Next question. The client states, I heard that all men get prostate cancer sometime in their lives. In teaching the client about cancer incidents, the best response is based on which of the following? One, lung cancer is the most frequently diagnosed cancer in men. Two, prostate cancer is the most frequently diagnosed cancer in men. Three, prostate cancer is the most prevalent in Caucasian men. Or four, there's no way to screen for prostate cancer, so it is the most common cause of cancer death in men. And guys, the correct answer is two. Prostate cancer is most frequently diagnosed cancer in men. That's the absolute truth. And you want to know the second most frequent cancer in men? A lung cancer. Number one is prostate, and immediately following that is lung cancer. So number one's wrong because number one is the uh, lung cancer is not the most frequently diagnosed cancer in men. I just told you that it is prostate cancer. Uh, lung cancer is number two. Choice number three, where it says prostate cancer is most prevalent in Caucasian men, black men. It's most prevalent in black men. And choice four, there's no way to screen for prostate cancer. Yes, there is. You know, patient gets prostate exams, PSAs. There are actually screening tests for prostate cancer. So that's false. The correct answer is number two. 
When planning the discharge of a client with cancer, which of the following should the nurse include as a priority? One, encouragement to drink no alcoholic beverages. Two, information on all local hospital hospitals. Three, plans for a visiting nurse or four, information on stress reduction techniques. And guys, the correct answer is four, stress reduction can, uh, techniques. So in teaching patients ways to reduce their cancer risk, redu reducing stress is one of it. Reducing stress, guys, can reduce a patient's not only their cancer risk, but it can also reduce the risk for reoccurrence of cancer. So four is the correct answer. Let's go through the other choices. One, encourage uh, to drink no alcoholic beverages. What did I just tell you guys about all inclusives? No, never, uh, um, only, always, right? Stay away from all inclusives unless you know that you know that you know that's the correct answer. And uh, for this case, guys, we wanna tell patients to limit their alcohol intake, but um, they don't have to quit alcohol altogether. So that's false. Um, choice two, information information on local hospices. Well, guys, you should know that's not the answer because we just did a question. I think that was the first question we covered where it was clear that how many people, about 5 million people in the U.S. survive cancer for five years or more. So just because this patient has this diagnosis, does that mean that's a death sentence, that this patient's terminally ill? Absolutely not. So we know that's not um, the correct answer choice. Uh, three, plans for a visiting nurse. Just because a patient has cancer does not mean that they need a visiting nurse. It does not mean that this patient's homebound, that they can't go to their doctor's visits. Absolutely not. So the correct answer is stress reduction because uh, evidence-based practice uh, studies have shown that reduction of stress has reduced chances of patients getting cancer or reoccurrence of cancer. While assessing a client's skin, the nurse should report which of the following findings as possible skin cancer. One, red swollen plaques. Two, bullseye rash. Three, blue black appearing mole. Or four, spider angiomas. And guys, the correct answer is three, blue black appearing moles. Guys, matter of fact, blue black appearing mole, that is the cardinal sign of melanoma, skin cancer. Okay, that is characteristic of melanoma. Now let's look at our other cho um, choices. One, red swollen plaque when you hear that word plaque what should you be thinking of psoriasis if you guys um are taking um integumentary right now or you need to review i've got lots of videos on the integumentary system and i also you know talk about psoriasis in depth so you guys go ahead and review that video if you need to two a bullseye rash what do you think of when you think of bullseye rash Lyme disease, and last, uh, spider angi angiomas. This happens, guys, when the patient's vessels are weak, they're dilated, and you can see them be beneath the patient's skin, okay? So when it comes to um, possible skin cancer, it's number three, the blue, black appearing mole, and you need to be thinking of melanoma. A nurse is educating a group of clients on cancer screening, practices. Which of the following instructions should the nurse include as a recommended screening pattern? One, annual pap, pap and pelvic exam should begin at age 40. Two, annual cancer checkup for all persons over age 40. Three, annual mammography should begin at age 30. Or four, annual fecal occult blood test and colonoscopy at age 40. And guys, the correct answer is two. Annual cancer checkups for everyone, man, woman, for everyone, all persons over the age of 40. That is the correct answer, okay? Now, let's look at our other choices. One, an annual pelvic and um, an annual pap and pelvic exam should begin at age 40. No. What age should they begin? At 18, right? Number three, annual mammography should begin at age 30. No, that's too early, guys. It should begin at age what? 40. And then uh, number four, annual fecal occult blood test and colonoscopy at age 40. Actually, it's 45 to 50, depending on your risk. So risk meaning, you know, the age and race, right? So it's 40 to 50, depending on the patient's risk factors. And then they're going to 
uh, get the colonoscopy done every five to 10 years, again, depending on the previous results and the patient's risk factors. Next question. The nurse is caring for a client who underwent a bone marrow transplant 10 days ago. The nurse should monitor the client for which of the following clinical manifestations that indicates a potentially a life-threatening situation. One, mucosi mucositis, two, confusion, three, depression, or four, mild temperature elevation. And guys, the correct answer is for mild temperature elevation. Look how they try to trick you just because they put that word mild. We don't care if it's mild, moderate, or severe. A temperature elevation is a temperature elevation. And remember, guys, I've talked to you about this before. Any patient who's had surgery, I don't care what kind of surgery. If it's surgery, if it's invasive, we're concerned about three things. Infection hemorrhage, or that patient having a DVT or pulmonary embolism. So a bone marrow transplant obviously is an invasive procedure. We're going to be concerned about one of those, about those three things, which include infection, right? Right. Now let's look at the type of procedure. Bone marrow. Patients who are getting bone marrow transplants, they're going to be on what? Lots of what? steroids why because we don't want the patient to um their body to reject that transplant so this patient that's going to be on high dose steroids is already immunocompromised so here we are with the patient that's immunocompromised that's on high dose steroids and we see a mild temperature elevation that is a cause for concern. That is life-threatening because remember, the fact that this patient's already immunocompromised, that they're on high-dose steroids, which cover those signs and symptoms of infection, us seeing that mild temperature elevation, that patient might already be septic, okay? So that's why number four is our answer. Choices one, two, and three, they need to be addressed, but they're not life-threatening like number four is, okay? Six days after receiving chemo, the client reports that my mouth feels like it's on fire. Which of the following is a priority nursing action? One, encourage rinsing the mouth several times per day with an over-the-counter mouthwash. Two, administer analgesics as ordered. Three, assess the oral mucosa for signs of infection and tissue breakdown. Or four, instruct the client to eat small frequent meals of soft foods such as applesauce. And guys, the correct answer is three. Assess the oral mucosa for signs of infection and tissue breakdown. You need to be suspecting, you know, stomatitis or mucositis, right? Assess, add pie. You're going to assess before you diagnose, before you plan, before you intervene, before you evaluate. You are going to assess. And that's why that's the correct answer. All right, let's look at our other choices. One, encourage rinsing mouth several times a day with what? Mouthwash. See, that's where they went wrong. Number one, you need to assess first. But let's say you would be doing an intervention. This still would not be the correct answer because we don't want them rinsing their mouth with a mouthwash, which is very harsh. We would want them uh, rinsing their mouth with like um, a salt or some kind of um, sodium uh, solution, soda solution, right? But not mouthwash. It's very harsh on the mouth. Absolutely not. So that would have been wrong anyway. Number two, administer analgesics as ordered. Well, an administering analgesics as ordered, that is a wonderful choice for an intervention. After we've assessed the patient, after we've called the doctor and told the doctor what our findings were, and then the doctor ordered the analgesics, but we can't intervene until we assess. So that's still not the correct answer. Choice four, look at what choice four says. It says, instruct the client to eat small frequent meals of soft food, um, such as applesauce. Well, that's another great teaching, which is an assessment, but you can't do an assessment until you... Guys, it's a great teaching, which is an intervention, but you cannot do an intervention until you do what? An assessment. How are you going to know what to teach a patient if you haven't assessed your patient to figure out what's going on yet, right? So that's why number three is the correct answer choice. In preparing a client on oral narcotic analgesics for discharge after mastectomy, the nurse should include which of the following in the post-op teaching. One, use oral narcotics sparingly to avoid constipation. Two, bowel training program. Three, high protein, low carb diet plan. Or four, upper extremity weight training program. 
And guys, the correct answer is two, bowel training program. This patient just had major surgery, right? So they had major surgery and they're on narcotics, we expect them to what? May be constipated. So bowel training program, this is going to include lots of fluids. And when I say fluids, I'm talking about water, right? Lots of fluids, lots of fiber. You want that patient to get up moving because the more the patient moves, the more um, peristalsis goes on in the GI, GI tract, the less chance that patient has of uh, being uh, constipated, right? So the correct answer is going to be your bowel training program. You want them on lots of fluids. You want them on lots of fiber. Um, you want them moving about. You want them on stool softeners. All of that is included in the bowel training program. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, use oral narcotics sparingly to avoid constipation. No, that patient is going to be in pain and they need to take those narcotics as ordered as needed. Choice three, high protein, low carb diet. No, what kind of diet is the patient going to be on? High fiber diet because we want to avoid constipation. Choice four, upper extremity weight training program. Think about this, guys. This patient, what kind of mastectomy? Okay, they didn't say what kind of mastectomy, so we don't know if just one or both. But the patient had a mastectomy, right? Do we want them lifting heavy objects? Absolutely not. Matter of fact, that's part of the teaching that you teach that patient not to lift heavy objects on that side, right? We're gonna do gentle range of motion exercises on the arms where the patient had the mastectomy, but no heavy lifting. We don't want to apply any pressure to the surgical site. So the only correct answer here, guys, is number two. The nurse is caring for a client with small cell lung cancer. Which of the following observations would be a priority that the nurse should report immediately? One, weight loss. Two, serum sodium less than 130. Three, headache. Or four, urinary output greater than 60 mLs per hour. And guys, the correct answer is two, serum sodium of less than 130. What's your normal serum range? 135 to 145, right? So once, one, less than 130, that patient's what? Hyponatremic. That's a problem within itself, right? That's already a problem. Now, think about small, what's the patient? Small cell lung cancer. When a patient has small cell lung cancer, what are they at risk for? SIADH, syndrome of inappropriate um, diuretic hormone. Remember SIADH and um, um, diabetes insipidus, those are complete opposites, where you have diabetes insipidus, the patient has a high urine output. They're urinating all over the place, right? But um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the solutes is very low because they're holding on to the sodium, the sodium's high. But in the opposite, in SIADH, the patient's holding on to all of their fluids. Their urine output is very low. But the little bit of urine that they do release, the solutes are what? High. They're getting rid of all their sodium, so that patient will be hyponatremic, right? So when you're thinking of um, small cell lung cancer, you need to be thinking also of SIADH, which that patient is at risk for, where that patient is going to have decreased urine output, but increased solute, decreased sodium level. And that's why, guys, a number two is our correct answer choice. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. <coughs> I'm trying to give up coffee, so I've been drinking coconut water. It hasn't been working. Those that have been following me and watching my videos for a while now, for a couple years. How many times have I tried to get off coffee, guys? What's this? Nine, ten, I don't know. But I'm not a quitter, so I'm not going to give up. I'll get there one day. All right, guys. Next question. The nurse should instruct a client that which of the following is the most effective prevention against bladder cancer? One, drinking eight to ten glasses of fluid per day. Two, avoiding at least five times per day. Three, stop smoking, or four, taking herbal supplements. And this is a no-brainer, right? 
stop smoking. Guys, you know that smoking increases the patient's risk for every single type of cancer known to man. You know this. This was a no-brainer. Stop smoking. Who else is at risk for cancer? Smokers, and what kind of cancer are we talking about? That, oh, okay, bla specifically, bladder cancer. Besides uh, being a smoker, white men over the age of 50 who have like an occupation in industrial like leather or, uh, um, or rubber, okay? Um, or even dyes. Those are the patients that are at risk for specifically this type of cancer which is bladder cancer. All right, which of the following should the nurse include in the pre-op care plan of a client with head and neck cancer? Oh my gosh, guys, this is a famous question on NCLEX. You need to know this. One, instruct the client and family in communicating with a picture board. Two, assess the client's favorite foods to assure these are provided post-op. Three, plan for a volunteer to take the client outside outside for cigarette breaks or four provide client uh provide frequent oral care including rinsing with mouthwash and the correct answer is one guys this is a famous test question you guys have to know this i want you to think about it look what the type of cancer patient has head and neck so where do you think they're going to have surgery or radiation to the head and neck tongue, larynx may be involved. So you have to plan with the patient before surgery how they're going to communicate after surgery because most likely that patient's not going to be able to speak. So they have to find alternate means of communication. This is a famous test question. You must know this. So let's look at the wrong answer choices, guys. One, no, one's correct. Two, assessing client's favorite food to make sure they have it post-op. Well, here's the problem with that. Post-op, most likely they're going to have what? A feeding tube. And then after the feeding tube, they're going to be on a soft mechanical diet. So they're not going to be having their favorite foods anytime soon, most likely. So that's wrong. Choice number three, you know that's wrong. You're never going to assist a patient in smoking, ever. That's never going to be the answer unless they're asking you which one's the wrong answer choice. So let's get rid of that. And then choice four, provide frequent oral care, including rinsing with what? Mouthwash. Did I not just tell you that mouthwash is too harsh? We are not going to do that. So we know that's not the right answer choice. So the correct answer choice is teach a patient in advance that they may not be able to communicate vocally so we have to come up with a plan such as a picture board or dry erase you know magic marker how the patient is going to be able to communicate a client who's been treated for lung cancer returns to the clinic and during the nursing assessment reports recent problems with balance and memory based on the nurse's understanding of lung cancer the appropriate action will be which of the following one reassure the client that these are just common signs of aging Two, recommend that the client obtain ginkgo. How do I pronounce this? Ginkgo? Ginkgo? Guys, I don't know. Ginkgo from the health food store. Three, perform a more thorough assessment. Four, call for an ambulance as this is an oncology emergency. Guys, please don't come for me when it comes to um, pronunciation. English is my third language not first not second but my third language so you know i have pronunciation issues sometimes but it's okay you know what i'm talking about so guys the correct answer is three perform a more thorough assessment so this patient has lung cancer but all of a sudden they're coming in and saying that they're having problems with let me see what they're having problems with with balance and memory First of all, having problems with balance and memory, that is not a normal part of aging. So you're not going to say that to the patient. That's wrong. Patient has lung cancer. Now, all of a sudden, they're having problems with balance. They're having problems with memory. What are you suspecting? Uh-oh, maybe the cancer has metastasized to the brain. So you're going to do a more in-depth assessment. And remember, guys, assessment is not only a physical examination. Assessment is anything that you do to get more information from the patient. So assessment could be asking the patient more questions. Assessment could be going into the chart and looking for information, okay? 
So look at wrong answer choices. One, reassure. Do we ever reassure patients? Absolutely not. That is not their communi communication. We do not reassure patients. That's wrong. Okay. And if we kept going, let's say you didn't under, you didn't realize that reassuring a patient's wrong and you kept going. It goes reassure and let them know that th this is common in aging. No, it's not. So it's still wrong. Choice two, recommend the client obtain ginkgo or jinkle. However that's pronounced, just know that that's like a herb. It's an over-the-counter, you know, herb. And we don't recommend that. You can't play doctor. So that's wrong. And choice four, call for an ambulance, cause, ambulance because this is an on oncology emergency. No, it's not. The patient's not in immediate danger. Their life is not in danger right now, so that's incorrect. So the correct answer, guys, is number three. Number three, you need to do a, a more thorough assessment, get more information from this patient. The spouse of a client with early stage prostate cancer asked the nurse, why is it the physician treating my husband's cancer? The nurse's best response should be based on which of the following. One, watchful waiting is often appropriate for men over the age of 70. Two, the client must really have stage four cancer, which is not curable. Three, all prostate cancer should be treated and this client should get another opinion. Or four, the client is being treated with hormonal, with hormonal manipulation, which isn't perceived as treatment by clients. Okay guys, and the correct answer? The only answer that's correct here, guys, is number one, watchful waiting is often appropriate for men over the age of 70. So guys, in older men, the prostate grows very slowly, okay? So when it comes to men that are over 70, um, it's best to take a watch and wait approach because of the age the radiation or the surgery might kill them before the actual cancer does. Now, uh, choice two, the client must have stage four cancer. No, they don't. It just says in the question that they have early stage, so it's definitely definitely not stage four. Um, choice three, all. Okay, um, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, choice three, where it says all, all cancer should be treated and this, can and this client should get another opinion. What did I tell you? What did I tell you about all inclusives? All, always, no, never, only, stay away from them. Do not pick them unless you know that you know that's the correct answer. And no, it's not. So that's false. We're not going to choose that. And lastly, the client is being treated with hormonal manipulation, um, Guys, actually, hormone treatment, we save that for um, a cancer that is more advanced. This, patient, this cancer is in the early stage, so we're really not going to give that patient hormone treatment. When do we give hormone treatment? Like I said, when that uh, cancer is more advanced. Next question. While performing a nursing assessment, a female client informs the nurse of vague abdominal discomfort, bloating, and unexplained indigestion and flatulence for the last few months. What should the nurse, nurse ask in order to elicit the most important information for completing the assessment? One, do you often eat spicy food? Two, tell me about your family's medical history. Three, have you had weight loss recently? Or four, are you experiencing unusual menstrual bleeding? By the way, this is a famous question if you are moving forward and um, you're taking your test to be a nurse practitioner. Famous question. Okay, and the correct answer is two. Tell me about your family's medical history. Now, I want you guys to notice a couple things. Number one, all of the other choices are closed-ended questions. Patient has to answer yes or no. The correct answer choice is the only one that's open-ended where the patient has to actually explain. That's number one. The second thing I want you to notice. You see those signs and symptoms, the vague abdominal discomfort, the bloating, the unexplained indigestion, and flatulence. The reason ovarian cancer is so deadly, so deadly, is because these mild symptoms are about the only symptoms patients have when they have ovarian cancer.
So what happens is by the time it's discovered that the patient has ovarian cancer, it's already metastasized everywhere in that patient's body. Okay, so I want you to keep that in mind. So the correct answer is number two. Um, number one, do you eat spicy food? That has nothing to do with anything because those mild symptoms are the only symptoms that you'll see of what? Ovarian cancer. Choice three, have you had weight loss uh, recently? Actually, this patient... Um, they would be gaining weight, if anything. And the reason they would be gaining weight is, would be because of that abdominal ascites that the patient would start to develop. And choice number four, are you experiencing any unusual menstrual bleeding? Unusual menstrual bleeding, guys, we see that in uterine cancer, not ovarian. Next question. A nurse is teaching a class on breast self-examination. Which of the following should the nurse include in the class? One, use only deep pressure when palpating the breast. Two, include both inspection and palpation of the breast in the exam. Three, use the fingertips while palpating the breast. Or four, perform the breast palpation exam in front of a mirror. And guys, the correct answer is two. Include both inspection to visualize, to look, and palpation to feel. Let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, use all, how many times in this video did I tell you to stay away from all inclusives? Always, never, no, only. Don't choose them unless you know that you know that you know it's the correct answer. And no, it's not the correct answer. That's wrong. Choice three, use the fingertips. No, what is the patient supposed to use? The pads of their fingers, the pads. As a matter of fact, they need to be, need to be using the first three of their finger, not the fingertips. So that's wrong. Um, choice four, perform breast palp. Guys, in front of the mirror, you're going to inspect, not palpate. The re whole reason you're using the mirror is because when you're looking down at your breast, you can only see the top, but you wanna be able to see the sides and under the breast. So you're using the mirror to see everything, not feel everything, duh. Come on, guys, this is critical thinking. So the correct answer is number two. When planning care for a client being treated for cervical cancer, it would be a priority for the nurse to include which of the following in the plan of care. One, instruction of birth control methods. Two, vigorous fluid hydration. Three, assessment of sexual function. Or four, daily weights. And guys, the correct answer would be three, assessment of sexual function. Why? Because some side effects in the treatment of um, the cervical cancer, guys, is um, shortening of the vagina. And another really big one is vaginal dryness and decreased libido. So you have to assess the patient's uh, sexual function or if there's any sexual dysfunction, you know, teach them that there are um, lubricants on the market for the uh, vaginal dryness and assess them for the decreased libido, okay? All right, guys, we are down to our very last question. This is another famous question. So make sure you know, not the question, guys, but the content. Okay, this content is very famously seen on NCLEX. The nurse is teaching a class on breast cancer. Which of the following should the nurse include as risk factors? One, menopause at an early age and excessive caffeine use. Two, slender build and first birth before the age of 20. Three, menarche at an early age and nulli paris. Or four, Asian descent and lower socioeconomic status. This is important, you need to know this for breast cancer. All right, risk factor of breast cancer is three. Getting the menstrual cycle early, early menarche, and nulliparis, having never given birth to a live child, okay? Those increase, increases a patient's risk for breast cancer. Guys, I hope you found this video to be helpful. If you want more oncology cancer videos, please let me know in the comments and I'll make sure I prepare them for you. I definitely will add them to my list. Please don't forget 
to check out my content and resources I have available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Make sure you guys check me out across all my social media platforms. And something I forgot to mention, don't forget that I have a podcast for uh, registered nurses and nurse practitioners. I'm on every major streaming platform just about, and the handle's still the same, Nexus Nursing. Please do not forget to like and subscribe below. Thank you so much for sharing this time. Guys, if you want to support my channel, please, please, please share my content. Share my content with friends, coworkers, classmates. If I've helped you in any way, that's how you can help me. Share my content to help me grow. Thank you so much, guys, and you'll be seeing me on the next video.